Welcome back to By Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Eugene Perrier, here with Sean Blackman. And as always, we're your guide to connecting the political, social, and economic movements shaping the world around us. And we are continuing the conversation here, turning to some of the other issues happening in Venezuela, some uh, on-the-ground reporting uh, as well here. Very happy to be joined for this conversation by Arnold August, who's a Canadian journalist and lecturer, the author of many, many books, uh, all of which I can highly recommend for you, but the recently released Cuba, U.S. Relations, Obama, and Beyond, very worth checking out. Arnold, thank you so much for being back with us. It's always a pleasure being with you. Well, definitely great to have you here. You were recently in Venezuela, I believe February 3rd, February 4th, which is obviously a uh, very notable anniversary there, February 4th of the 4F uh, uprising in in 1992 there, uh, led by uh, Commander Chavez. So you were certainly there. Uh, You know, one thing I'm I'm curious about here, just in terms of uh, some of your impressions of what's going on in Venezuela now, I saw former Prime Minister of Spain, uh, Zapatero, say in the Spanish press yesterday that people are very confused about what's going on. He said, Venezuela and the Venezuelan people have more capacity for resistance than anyone in the international community knows or is recognizing. I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. So basically saying that this coup is not going to work. And if they try to keep pushing it, you know, Venezuela is not that easy to, to turn over. So I'm curious your thoughts having having been there and the sense you're getting. I mean, are you getting a similar uh, sense that the sort of resistance to these moves, at least amongst a you know, significant plurality of the population, is pretty strong? I think I completely agree with former Prime Minister Zapato. He's absolutely right. I was there, as you mentioned, for uh, just a couple of days. It was not very long. But the highlight of the visit, I was not, did not have too much time to speak with the people on the ground. But however, and I think in the international context now, in the context of Venezuela, what was important with regard to that visit to Caracas was able to uh, participate in a small, relatively small, pri- semi-private meeting with Nicolas Maduro. Now, he spoke there for one hour. I was about, say, 10 feet away from him uh, in the front row of the uh, invited guests, and it, it was really important. I already heard him speak, but what hit, what made an impression on me, and it coincides with the uh, view of uh, Zapato, was that he went into quite some detail how he, as the commander of all the armed forces, has been meeting with the different sections of the armed forces, that is, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the National Guard, and the National Militia. And he went into quite some detail how they, on the one hand, the government, the leadership, the commander-in-chief is providing orientation and sort of giving a pep talk to them, but he also mentioned that uh, they were uh, very much moved by his uh, determination to to defend uh, Venezuela. And at the same time, he mentioned he also was very moved to see how these ordinary uh, soldiers, women and, and, and male soldiers at different sections of the National Armed Forces are really ready to fight to the end, including speaking to uh, pilots, of course, in the Air Force, which form a very part of any defense uh, against any attempt by the United States to uh, intervene militarily in uh, Venezuela, and of course the national militia, which is a very important part of the national defense uh, as well. I think, so what really hit me was the, the description of it by President Maduro, and also his obvious, to me, sincerity, and his complete commitment to the sovereignty and the defense of Venezuela, even ready to you know, give his own life, if, you, if we may speak uh, in that way. And that, that is a really important point. And I came, that's what I came back with, that, that impression. And when he mentioned in his speech, among other things, developing this notion how they are being prepared once again to defend Venezuela against any American military incursion, he said that no Yankee soldier will enter Venezuela. Anyone could say that, but when he said that, after describing the work that's going on on the ground to uh, prepare the defense forces, it, it, it was very sincere, credible. And I really believe him. No American soldier will enter Venezuela. Well, we could be cruel. They may enter, but you know how they go back 
is something else. That g- r- reminds me of images that we had when we were younger in the war against uh, American war against uh, Venezuela, against uh, Vietnam, excuse me. So when I got back, I highlighted one of my articles, quoting Maduro, uh, no Yankee soldier wherever will ever enter Venezuela. I-, I wrote it, it was published. I said to myself, maybe I'm putting myself uh, uh, getting myself into some trouble, uh, putting this forward as one of the main things I came uh, back with. However, it's coming over as being very, very true, because that was on February 4th, 2019, right? Or uh, February 20th. And not one American soldier has even tried to enter Venezuela. So what he said, no American soldier will ever enter Venezuela, it's right, and I'm sure it will keep on being right. And tr- when I, I noticed Trump when he spoke, I think it was two days ago in Miami, correct me if I'm wrong, Eugenia, but I, he said uh, that uh, he, he directed his talk to the Venezuelan military, pleading with them, don't support Maduro, you know, give up and uh, come over to our side and you will be taken care of and all that. That just so, you know, he did it with a lot of bravo. bravo. But in fact, it really showed the weakness of the United States against that very strong, uh, what we call the civil military union in Venezuela. Uh, And and that's what I came back with, and I'm happy I put that forward in my writing and how I'm talking with you today, Mm -hmm. to stress that notion of of the uh, military preparedness of Venezuela, but as part of of the uh, Venezuelan nation, part of the uh, of the Venezuelan people, a very important and historical uh, event that has been taking place in the last couple of weeks. Is that defense of the sovereignty that not even the mightiest country in the world has yet uh, attempted to intervene? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, very pressing at points, and I I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about this this civilian military union, the civic military union, because I think it speaks very heavily to some of these issues. I think a lot of people are wondering, well, why has the military not broken? But, you know, I think uh, uh, certainly President Chavez and the broader Chavista movement, you know, for some time now, even before they were really in power, have been working to build this sort of civic military union, patriotic, socialist oriented kind of of consciousness uh, over a certain amount of time. And it seems that, you know, to some degree that that's paying off now to when we see the sort of unity, not only of the military themselves behind Maduro, but also just sort of the easy interplay uh, between the armed forces and, in many cases, uh, the armed people. Yes, this is a very good uh, condensed manner in which you put it, and I really like it, uh, like the way you you mentioned that. It was very, very well indicated. And I think one thing that we we might want to add, you know, with regards to people uh, not being, the United States not being able to uh, break that down, is that the Venezuelan armed forces, other other uh, unlike others in, for example, Chile or Argentina, they come from amongst the working people, the peasants, etc. It's a different thing. People go into the armed forces, such as one example, of course, we know is Hugo Chavez, because they were very poor, and was the only way that they could get some education or whatever. And so it is based in the first place on the grassroots, on the most most humble people in Venezuela. This is different with regards to other militaries in the region, such as uh, Argentina and Chile, which is mainly whose militaries are mainly guided and uh, and geared to the needs of the uh, middle class or the wealthy who uh, would uh, use the uh, armed forces to uh, increase their own political and economic power within the country. So the United States is dealing with an entirely new concept in terms of armed forces. And, and this is, uh, they do not realize it. They might know it, but they don't want to face the reality that this is what is happening in, in, in Venezuela at this time. That And, and the, uh, you know, once again, I was had some time to spend amongst the people in the, in the, the uh, iconic uh, Bolivar Plaza in, in Caracas. And the, so these are really determined people. They're very conscious. When I spoke there, I mentioned some very tricky issues. For example, the question of uh, of, of Trudeau, the Trudeau, Justin Trudeau government supporting the United States discourse on Venezuela. When I spoke, you saw they already knew that the despite the uh, the image that is being projected 
with, by the international media with regards to Justin Trudeau, these Chavistas, they see right through it. Mm. They say, they, you know, how can you have, a, you know, despite his smile and he's a cool guy and all that, a bit like Obama before, how can there any, be anything good to him when he lies himself with someone like Trump to interfere in the internal affairs of another country. So the Javistas are, are, they just don't, you know, repeat slogans or, or whatever, or, or say things just for saying things. They are politically conscious. That, that is, I think, one of the main foundations of the Bolivarian Revolution. And I think I would say is that one of the main heritage, Chavez, how, how through his own activities, right until he passed away, he taught people how to think how to analyze. And that, that tradition is still going on. And I think that the Venezuelan leadership, including Hugo Chavez, made a very good decision in suggesting that Maduro should be the president carrying on that Chavista tradition. When I see him speak, when I hear him speak, it reminds me a lot of, of uh, former President uh, Hugo Chavez. They're part of that whole movement that's been actually building up since the 1980s. You know, that those movements in the 1980s, they were connected with revolutionary guerrilla movements from uh, revolutionary communists from the 1980s, 1970s. So you have this very long tradition of revolutionary movement in Venezuela that, that was captured by Chavez when he won the elections back in December 1998, and it's been going on since then. And I think, uh, in my view, it's really an important... What is important in Venezuela is important internationally. When I heard Maduro speak, he said, if I remember correctly, he said that Venezuela did not want this, but we looks like we're becoming the ep international or ge international epicenter of anti-imperialism. And, and in the course of his same discussion, he sort of spoke as if they are the epicenter of anti-imperialism and the way things are going, I would say that this is right, that the Venezuelan Bolivarian Revolution has now become the epicenter of the international left. Everyone in the world has to take a position for or against the Bolivarian Revolution, or at least for or against the right of Venezuela to determine its own future. So I think by being in the epicenter of the left, looking at the U.S. straight in the eyes, Venezuela, willingly or not, is pushing the whole left more towards the left, while others who are standing on the sidelines, the middle of the rotors, are being exposed as to what they really are. For example, can we believe it, Eugene, that after all this time since the coup started back in January, that you know the uh, liberal icons uh, of the left, such as Bernie Sanders or uh, AOC, they have yet to make a statement on Venezuela? Is that an accident? Are they just waiting it out to see whether the United States can win and they'll jump on the back uh, uh, bandwagon to pe be part of the American retaking, recolonization of Venezuela? Yes, on the other hand, the people on the left are moving more and more toward the left. The, the, the American imperial, imperialist haughty at, at attitude towards Venezuela are pushing people on the left, progressive people, even if they're not communists or revolutionaries, or whatever, pushing more and more people more and more to the left against the United States and in favor of the right of Venezuela to defend its own sovereignty. I think we're going through some very uh, positive moments. I think that Mr. Trump once again got it wrong when he said that this this now the this is the signaling the death knell of socialism. I would say it's the opposite. There's a resurgence in terms of real socialism, not the Bernie Sanders type of democratic socialism that can't even not cannot even take a stand of Venezuela, but real socialism whereby the, the people take power in their own hands and to build a new society based on social justice and equality and above all against U.S. imperialism. I think this is what is happening. I am increasingly optimistic about the situation for Venezuela, Latin America, and the world. Like right here in Canada, this whole issue of Justin Trudeau siding with Trump has put you know, over 5 million members of Canadian trade unions 
have taken a very strong stand against Trudeau, against the Trudeau-Trump alliance. This is very good. And in their statements, they don't mince words. <laughs> they say, we are against the imperial policy of domination of Latin America. And so I think that everything is moving to the left and in, you know, in the main, thanks to the Bolivarian Revolution, its leadership, and also the millions of Chavistas on the ground who are playing a very important role in international politics at this time. Yeah, and Mr. August, this notion of uh, Venezuela being the epicenter of anti-imperialism and how that's um, helping draw some uh, strict lines along in, in the political landscape, I think is important. And I mean, do you see that as really being the root of why the Trudeau government has uh, taken the stance that it uh, has uh, against Venezuela? Because it's hard to look at this attempted coup as anything but uh, 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 an imperial effort, if you know what I mean, a colonial effort uh, in that sense and trying to control the land resources and uh, a destiny of a sovereign nation with a democratically elected government. But I mean, do you think it's that uh, imperial orientation that's basically coloring the uh, uh, orientation of the Trudeau government? Yes, for sure. I mean, for example, you the, the term, as you uh, correctly mentioned, is the epicenter. And I think the Trudeau government, there's a lot of material that has been produced by some of my colleagues here in Canada, amongst others, Eve Engler, who I would say is the main Canadian specialist on Canadian foreign affairs. He details how Canadian businesses, especially mining, have been angling to undermine the Bolivarian Revolution since the election of Chavez, because it interferes with their control of the natural resources in that country. And so it is an extension of this. And But I would also like to say that the problem is that yes, uh, the day before yesterday, Trump made a very powerful statement against Cuba. He basically said, uh, when I was in Havana, just going to Caracas uh, also a few days ago, and many of my colleagues were telling me that all of the propaganda at that time, a week ago, was against Venezuela. But we know that the cherry on the Sunday for the United States is Cuba. Uh, this came up really uh, in Miami a couple of days ago when Trudeau, when uh, sorry, when um, uh, Trump went all out to attack Venezuela. Cuba, Nicaragua, as a, you know, a basis, the, an evil basis of socialism and all that. So the problem is now Trudeau, who's supposed to be a friend of Cuba, we have very good relation with Cuba right from the beginning that was never broken, even by the 1959 revolution. What will he say? Will he have the guts to stand up and say, at least denounce what Trump said with regards to Cuba, because Canada has formal relations with Cuba, and this is not the way a, a country such as Canada should have relationship with a country such as Cuba. What will he do? I think he's in a very difficult situation. But with regards to the move on the part of the companies in Canada to extend their influence and thus aligning themselves with someone like Trump, who is hated, and I could swear on that, no one in Canada likes Trump. Every, everyone hates him. Okay, there's no small minority who support him. He's universally hated. But Trudeau, the nice guy, the smiling, the Pepsi and smile, is aligned with Trump. So this is becoming a major problem. Yeah, interesting contradictions. Unfortunately, we're going to have to, to leave it there uh, for now, Arnold. But as always, really appreciate you joining the show, giving us your direct impressions of being down there in Venezuela. We're going to have to move to a break here on By Any Means Necessary on Radio Sputnik. But we'll be back. So stay with us. By any means necessary. 